A week or two ago, in the New York Times, Christopher Lehman Haupt reviewed Beyond Freedom and Dignity. He began with two sentences dear to the hearts of my publishers who are not going to allow them to get lost under a bushel. Later on, though, really seriously concerned about some of the implications, he tries to fault me, and he writes as follows. Well, then, what about the most serious and best advertised attack that has been leveled against behaviorism in recent years, namely Noam Chomsky's attempts to demonstrate man's innate linguistic powers, which began with Chomsky's famous review of Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior. Skinner says nothing explicit on the matter in Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Indeed, Chomsky's name is never brought up, which seems disingenuous on Skinner's part. Have we got him there? Well, let me tell you about Chomsky. <laughs> I published Verbal Behavior in 1957. In 1958, I received a 55-page typewritten review by someone whom I had never heard of named Noam Chomsky. I read half a dozen pages and saw that he had missed the point of my book and read no further. In 1959, I received a reprint from a journal called Language reduced now to 32 pages in type, and saw that it was the same review by this unknown character, and so I put it aside without reading it. Then, of course, Chomsky's star rose. A whole new movement welled up in linguistics, generative transformational grammar. And the linguists have this peculiar capacity to make whatever they do seem terribly important. I remember a decade when we were all excited about the analysis of the phoneme, and then a decade when it was semantics, backed up a bit by the logical positivists. And then came the decade of syntax and grammar. And Chomsky's review of my book began to be widely cited, and reproduced, reprinted, became much better known than my book. <laughs> and then word got around, why, why was I not answering it? Well, by that time, I had no inclination to do so at all. In the first place, if I were to answer it, I should have had to read it. And I had no intention of doing that. Moreover, I should have had to read up on generative grammar, which I found very boring. And I should have had to go into the broader issues. Chomsky is the intellectual child of Roman Jakobson, and Claude Lévi-Strauss is another in another field, anthropology. And they represent a movement called structuralism, which is quite clearly not my cup of tea. It uh, is an effort to explain behavior in terms of the form or topography or structure of the behavior without appealing to any prior causes. And this seems to me a hopeless task. So I actually didn't answer Chomsky, unfortunately, I don't need to now because a psychologist, Kenneth McCorkwoodale, has done a beautiful job taking Chomsky's review apart page by page. This has been published in the Journal of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior. But the whole thing got out of hand. It, uh, it went way beyond linguistics. It began to be said that I was the modern representative of John Locke back in the 17th century, the British empiricist who felt that the mind began as a clean slate at tabula rasa, 
and that all knowledge came from experience, while well, Chomsky was the modern intellectual descendant of René Descartes, the rationalist who believed that you had to think even before you uh, were aware that you existed. Well, Newsweek magazine uh, wrote an article along these lines several years ago and more or less implied that I was winning out. This enraged the Chomskyites, and a flood of letters came in, of which Newsweek thought it wise to publish four. Each one, in its own way, repeated a common misunderstanding of my position. One contended that I am a stimulus response psychologist, which I am not. Another contended that I think people are nothing more than pigeons, which I do not. The one I liked best had at least a touch of wit. Going back to those 17th century progenitors, the letter writer advised Newsweek to lock up Skinner and give Chomsky Descartes Blanche. <laughs> But even that is curiously mal apropos. Chomsky doesn't want a carte blanche. That's too much like a tabula rasa. <laughs> he wants the table d'hote, arranged by some unseen hand in the kitchen. Now, ironically, Chomsky was later asked to give the John Locke lectures at Oxford. <laughs> well, I was at the University of Cambridge at the time, and the philosophers at Oxford had me come over before Chomsky arrived and sort of prepare the way. And then the BBC thought it would be fun to uh, have us debate this issue on television. I don't know what reason Chomsky gave for refusing. I imposed some qualifications. Chomsky talks a great deal. If anyone wants to disprove Alfred Adler's thesis that a man goes into a field in which he has some natural shortcoming, I suggest he cite uh, Noam Chomsky. <laughs> I said that I would debate, provided the master of ceremonies could guarantee equal time. And I suggested that we use chess clocks. My clock would be running when I was talking. Chomsky's clock would be running while Chomsky was talking. And in this way, I plan to have the last 15 or 20 minutes to myself. <laughs>